What's, um, what's not funny is the um, reality of, uh, of uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is paralleling the epidemic of type 2 diabetes. In 2010, uh, by data of the Alzheimer's Association, one in three Americans were going to have Alzheimer's disease by 85. Uh, that is now increasing that it's predicted that one in two, 50% of Americans will have Alzheimer's disease by 85. You got to remember that this is a disease that doesn't exist in the animal kingdom. You know, elephants and others who even live as long or longer than us don't have documented uh, Alzheimer's disease. It's very rare in the blue zone populations on the planet that live, more people live over 100 than anywhere else. And uh, it's very rare. Uh, longevity village, China, where one out of seven people live over 100 degrees with their lifestyle, doesn't happen there. So this is something that we're doing to ourselves. And, uh, and you know, for me personally, I'll just wax personal for a minute. 2018 is kind of a, a noteworthy year. It's, it's my 40th year from residency graduation and I'm going to my 50th high school reunion. Some of you have already done these things. And I've been married for 45 years, so I just kind of, I'm a quantitative person. I like even numbers. But this stuff, which has just come out in the last six months, is, in my mind, the biggest game changer in my 40-year career. Now, how many of you at your hospitals and health systems are doing cognoscopies? None. How many of you have a clinic specifically applying Recode 3.0? None. Which I didn't expect you to. But, that's, but I'm glad, glad you put me in and get to hear the talk because you will get something new out of it. Research that started coming out it, in bigger form, published in 2017, has showed that cognitive decline may be prevented and even reversed. And we're going to talk about how that could be done at your hospital. Now, it started with Dale Bredesen. And this is his book that came out in August called The End of Alzheimer's, First Program to Prevent and Reverse Cognitive Decline. Now, Dale Bredesen is an academic neurologist at UCLA. Uh, he's also the founder of a Buck Institute on Aging. He's a... He's a heavily regarded academic. As a neurologist, he did not practice neurology. He did research. And he spent more than 20 years in the lab <coughs> trying to find the key to Alzheimer's disease. Very, very dedicated to coming up with the answer. He was part of some of the clinical trials of drugs. And uh, the focus was on the amylin plaques. Amylin plaques are outside the neuron the tau protein bundles of particles are inside the neuron. Now, there's a lot of debate in the scientific community which is more important, the amylin plaques or the tau tangles. And drugs have been developed to dissolve amylin plaques and, uh, and dissolve tau protein bundles. And every one of those drug trials, the patients got worse. Uh, and. Uh, and it was sort of like the drug companies had backed away, and you've heard read about drug companies getting out of the answer to Alzheimer's disease, that there would be a magic bullet to Alzheimer's disease. As um, Bredesen describes in part two of the book, part one of the book is the problem, it's epidemic, and he has a wonderful chapter in part one called How to Give Yourself Alzheimer's Disease. And it's basically an, a frenetic American lifestyle. We'll go into that in a minute. But if you want to give yourself Alzheimer's disease, he tells you how. Part two of the book is all the science, and it's a review of the science. It turns out that amylin plaques and tau bundles are defense mechanisms of our body to deal with the inflammation or toxicity that's given us Alzheimer's disease. So it's trying to cure a disease by treating the scars. And actually, uh, th those things are, are not pathophysiologically the cause, they're an effect of, of the disease. Now it turns out Dale Bredesen's wife is a family doctor and she trained in the intensive lifestyle medicine a thing called functional medicine and, um, and she basically said the only way you're going to fix Alzheimer's is to fix the lifestyle. 
And, uh, and so he decided to put her idea to the test. And in 2014, he published his first case in the journal Aging, in which he applied the essentially intensive lifestyle protocol to a woman with early Alzheimer's disease, and she got better. You know, she started to get better within months, and very rapidly she got better. He published this case report in 2014. In 2016, he published a case report of 11 cases of, of early and sometimes even moderate Alzheimer's disease, which reversed. Some just greatly improved, and this is all by objective neurocognitive testing. Uh, on volumetric MRIs, they actually regrow their hippocampus. That he's actually shown where radiologists said, wait a second, this is a mistake, we got our patients mixed up. Uh, six months later, their volumetric MRI, that's not the typical brain MRI you guys are ordering for looking for tumors and, and strokes, uh, but, but your radiologist can just add a software package right to their MRI to give you volumetric measurements of the hippocampus and other parts of the brain. But these patients showed regrowth. Now he's now done this in more than 200 people. He's developed a protocol three different times, so it's called RECODE 3.0. RECODE stands for Reversing Cognitive Decline. And he's offering the training online to learn how to do this protocol yourself. I'm applying the protocol in my practice. Several of us other doctors are doing it. We're going to be training our entire a group of 72, or more than 70 primary care doctors and several APPs we have to apply RECODE into their practice. Uh, and you can end up becoming RECODE certified. Uh, he, he's done it now, and uh, it doesn't matter if you're APOE4 positive or not. He's got a group of patients who have, you know, they're either homozygous or heterozygous for APO4E enzyme. And, uh, and even in patients who, are, who have two genes for Alzheimer's disease, which means they're likely to get Alzheimer's disease in their 50s, for example, uh, those patients reverse, kind of documenting the epigenetic nature. People don't have to get Alzheimer's, even with genetic rest, any more than Pima Indians have to get diabetes, uh, despite their genetic risk. So that's what Bredesen has come out with, and I'm going to go into the details here uh, in a minute. But interestingly enough, a husband and wife neurology team at Loma Linda University, now Loma Linda is a Seventh-day Adventist community, it's a Seventh-day Adventist university, uh, they are, believe in a whole food plant-based diet, they run a brain health clinic at Loma Linda to prevent cognitive decline. Uh, and they are finding patients reversing cognitive decline at Loma Linda. And uh, they came out actually just one month later, so it's really coincidental because books take a while to publish, with a book called The Alzheimer's Solution, the breakthrough program to prevent and reverse the symptoms of the, the cognitive decline at every age. And they present their data, and I'm going to talk about the protocol. It's got an incredible amount of overlap. But that's going on at Loma Linda. And not to be outdone, Daniel Amen of the Amen Clinics, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Daniel Amen, but he has five uh, clinics in America. We have one in Orange County. Amen is a psychiatrist who is very critical of the people in his field. He says psychiatrists are the only specialists that treat an organ they never look at. And, uh, and he's been doing SPECT scanning on his patients since his training and his entire career, which is a, which is a lower cost way of doing well, essentially a functional MRI. But it looks at parts of your brain that are hyperactive or underactive, and he's now got tens of thousands of these scans, because every he treats, no, he treats people with mental health problems of a variety of types, whether it be bipolar, major depression, uh, Parkinson's disease, and, uh, and people with cognitive decline. And he correlates data of both uh, pen and paper, cognitive testing, intensive interviews, spec scanning, to come up with treatment protocols for people. 
He's got a wonderful book called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. Um, and it's all about lifestyle and its components that I'm going to talk about. Uh, but he has data of reversing cognitive decline at his clinics. And the Memory Rescue book came out in November. So August, September, November, we have three books that are documenting intensive lifestyle modification for cognitive decline. Bredesen uses a metaphor. He says, having Alzheimer's is like having a roof with 36 different holes in it. And you can't fix a leaky roof by plugging one or two of the holes. If you're going to fix the leaf, leaky roof, you've got to plug all of the holes, and only a broad-based intervention will do that. Interestingly enough, Bredesen, who has NIH funding, he's running the metformin study to see if metformin has an impact on aging. We kind of have suggested evidence it does. Type 2 diabetics on metformin don't die on schedule like they're supposed to. They tend to live longer. And so there's something about metformin that causes people to not die, and, and he's got the NIH funding that's studying that. But he couldn't get any funding to, funding to do his Alzheimer's research. Not even the Alzheimer's Association would give him funding, which is kind of ironic. I think they might feel a little bit differently now. But let's talk about, he, he invented the term cognoscopy. So I wouldn't expect you to be doing this because uh, it, it's a new term. But it's, it's going to become commonly used because it, it's already developing it. And a co he says, you know, we all know what a colonoscopy is. And when I give talks on this in my community, I say, how many of you have had colonoscopies? And almost everybody has raised their hand. And then how many of you have had a cognoscopy? And nobody does. You know, he kind of points out that our colons are really important. But probably most of us would agree that our brains are even more important. And we ought to have our brain checked out. So a cognoscopy, which would be good for your hospital to do, there's some revenue here. Uh, first of all, it's extensive laboratory testing. I, Bredesen talks about kind of the three overlapping pathology of Alzheimer's. Inflammation, atrophy, and toxicity. And patients with Alzheimer's, based on very careful history and the laboratory work, you can have a good idea how much of one or the other they're suffering from because your intervention is going to be different. I mean, if someone has Alzheimer's disease because they're ingesting tons of ahi tuna and swordfish and they love uh, these large fish that are loaded with mercury today, uh, you can give yourself Alzheimer's disease by a lot of mercury consumption. You know, that's a, one of the examples of a, to a toxicity way of doing it. But what's interesting about his laboratory work is that the most important test is the fasting insulin, which is a test that probably most of you have never had done and don't include it as a routine test. But he's shown with his data that fasting insulin needs to be below 5 to reverse cognitive decline. Patients didn't show improvement until they could get their fasting insulins below 5. Now, the, the worst thing for the brain is a high blood sugar. You know, we've known that for a long time, and that's why type 2 diabetes and even pre-diabetes are associated with early onset, earlier onset of cognitive decline. The data is quite clear. If you have pre-diabetes, your rate of Alzheimer's disease is doubled at any age as a senior. And if you have type 2 diabetes, it's just gone from three times to four times the risk of cognitive decline at any age of the scene. High blood sugar is toxic for the brain. Now, when I went to medical school, I was taught that a normal fasting blood sugar was 60 to 90. You might remember those days. You know, the normal range of a test is based on the population who haven't been diagnosed with a disease. So, and we already heard from Dave that 94% of pre-diabetics don't even know they have pre-diabetes. But anyway, somewhere along the line, I think it was in the 90s, uh, the normal range for fasting blood sugar was changed to 70 to 100. And that's because most Americans had fasting blood sugars up to 100. So that was sort of the new normal. By the way, the endocrine society has always objected to that and felt that blood sugars over 90 are not normal, and they aren't normal. They're not healthy for sure. Um, but 
your, but sugar, you know, the brain runs on glucose. The brain tissue is made out of fat. So our brain is made out of fat and it runs on glucose. But our bodies are designed to turn fat or protein into blood sugar through gluconeogenesis. <coughs> And when that happens, your brain gets a pretty steady amount of sugar. It doesn't yo-yo. And when you've got you know, this higher carbohydrate, higher glycemic load, you're essentially stressing your body with peaks of blood sugar. That's bad for the brain. And it also causes higher insulin levels. So your fasting insulin level is a marker of the stability of your blood sugar. And, uh, and, and that's what he wants to get below five, uh, because that seems to be the threshold for improvement. And sugar is both inflammatory to the brain and the rate of brain atrophy is directly related to your blood sugar. So getting your fasting blood sugar below 90 and getting your insulin below five is now the target. I, did, I have those numbers. My, I just had my annual labs, my fasting sugar is 85 and my insulin is 3 point something. But only about 10% of the people you're going to see are going to have fasting insulin is below 5. Now when you go home and look at your normal range of insulin on your own lab, it'll say 2.6 to 24.9 because that's the average fasting insulin in our population without diagnosis of the disease, which of course is an absurd normal range, uh, 2.6 to 24.9. But you want to you want to get your inflammatory markers, your homocysteine, your high sensitivity CRP, your fasting insulin, fasting sugar, and a host of other tests, which I'm not going to go into detail uh, with now. But when I'm doing this work with patients who routinely want a cognoscopy. I kind of have divided his testing into kind of level one and level two. One of the biggest problems of functional medicine, and this is an impact of his wife on what he's doing, is in functional medicine they're doing, in my opinion, way too much testing. And they're doing um, uh, you know, that way. So you got you got, and they have way too many supplements. And when you read his book, you're going to go, my God, there's too much testing and too many supplements. And when Bredesen is challenged, he says, well, individualize it. The thing is, is he doesn't really give you direct guidance to individualize how to do, so we've had to do that ourselves. But that's that's the first part of, co of cognoscopy. The second part is to get a volumetric MRI. Now, I wouldn't, we don't do that on asymptomatic people who have good cognitive function, uh, but if they're beginning to show cognitive decline, we do it, and it gives us documentation of them truly being not due to depression or other factors. Genetic testing, he says, is part of cognoscopy. We do have a lab that we use with our Wellness Institute that will do APOE4 testing, uh, but he also says, you know, people can just do 23andMe and get very extensive testing. The FDA now allows 23andMe to do more and more things. They didn't before, but now it, it's all opened up and 23andMe testing, which costs, depending on your market, between one and $200, uh, will give you your APO4E along with a lot of other risks that you might have. So the genetic testing is in the public domain and it's inexpensive. And last, it's the neuro, neuropsychologic testing. He recommends a screening test in the primary care office and he recommends, I mean, he used, he's using the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Uh, that's what we use in the office. It only takes about 20 minutes to do. Your nurse can do it. Uh, if that's positive, you then go to full neuropsychological testing, which is a half day or more of tests to document, is there indeed cognitive decline? So that's a cognoscopy. Easy to, easy to integrate into our primary care practice. Uh, doesn't require a whole lot of extra time at all, uh, but can let you adjust so you can get an idea of where your patient is at with cognitive decline. So let's talk about the intervention. He calls it DESS, Diet, Exercise, Sleep, and Stress. And, um, and all of these are very, very important. 
The biggest part of it is the diet because malnutrition is probably the biggest trigger, but the others are very important too. That his diet is intermittent fasting at least 12 hours with a Mediterranean diet that is low in carbohydrates plus certain recommended supplements. So that's his intervention. So it's a Mediterranean diet that is low in carbohydrates. Obviously, it doesn't have sweets. He, he, you know, grains and sweets are out. Uh, other inflammatory foods are out, like vegetable oils uh, are out. Any foods that cause inflammation are not part of the Mediterranean diet he recommends, which is usually uh, things like avocado and other vegetables and olive oil, no restriction on fat, nuts, flaxseed, wild-caught fish, you know, healthy grass-fed meat, but meat is only a condiment. You know, it's a low meat uh, fit, uh, diet, but it's, you know, it's sort of the healthiest version of Mediterranean diet. <coughs> the fasting is important because, you know, we get brain clarity. One of the best things you can do for your brain is to not eat. I mean, I've stopped eating lunch on most days. You might see me eat a little salad here today for lunch, but skipping meals uh, and fasting is very healthy for the brain. It lowers your insulin. It lowers your blood sugar numbers. It's the best way to get lower fasting blood sugars. So intermittent fasting and Mediterranean diet. At least an hour a day of exercise. You know, we're all aware of the benefit of exercise on cognition. Unmedicated good sleep at least seven hours of sleep. Melatonin is okay, but no other drugs. And um, so, you know, helping work with your patients, get them off their Ambien, get them off their Tylenol PM. All of these drugs, you've probably seen the studies, are associated with cognitive decline. And then when you measure a morning cortisol level as a marker of how how much chronic stress might be there. But stress reduction is critical. And you try to get people's cortisol levels down to a low normal range. Uh, so we're recommending a lot of meditation, other deeper relaxation responses, trying to get people to de-stress. What's interesting, and it's not part of this protocol, is cognitive exercises. That kind of came up with Alan. But, but these DESS recommendations are not difficult to provide in a primary care setting. And so that's, uh, that's RECODE. The SureSci protocol, yes? Joe, do anti-inflammatory medications help at all with the inflammation of the, <coughs> like maybe aspirin or any, any benefit It's nutrition that? and supplements. He doesn't recommend any drugs at all. You know, he tells you, if you're already on the Alzheimer's drugs, he tells you don't stop them because everyone gets worse if you do stop them. Uh, but they're not part of the treatment at all and don't initiate them. But, um, you know, anti-inflammatory drugs haven't played a role. The, um, like the NSAIDs are actually bad for the gut microbiome. They have, you know, they're, they're uh, considered a no-no in the world of lifestyle medicine to be avoided. And it's really an anti-inflammatory diet. Now, the neuro protocol of the Scherzeis is pretty much the same. It's any -E URO nutrition. Now, they're getting the same results with a whole food plant-based diet. You know, uh, and, uh, and so you don't have to use purely a Mediterranean diet. It's a whole food plant-based diet. They only recommend two <coughs> supplements. Uh, B12, which vegetarians usually need to take, and fish oil. Uh, the DHA of fish oil is for the, the brain, EPA for the heart. Most pills have a combination of the two. Uh, but those are the only two supplements they use, where Bredesen lists, uh, you can consider 25 different supplements. So it gets a little bit crazy, but I, it's interesting that they're getting results. Now, there is no head-to-head -head comparison of which is more effective the Bredesen protocol or the Shurzai protocol, uh, but both are getting improvement in cognitive decline, which they found as somewhat of a surprise. They started their clinic to prevent cognitive decline or prevent further deterioration. Uh, they weren't expecting reversal, but that's what they're finding. 
The uh, exercise daily for an hour is the same. Unwind or stress reduction is the same. Restorative sleep of seven hours nightly without medication. Uh, melatonin is okay, so those are exactly the same. They do review the literature in their book about optimizing brain function. You know, the, uh, the luminosity people are pretty smart people. They have accepted the fact that their first generation of testing did not make a difference. But they're trying to figure out ways to make a difference. And what the Shurzai's talk about is people need to stay engaged with life planning and life problem solving and life engagement like they did during their, their working life. That is, don't retire from keeping your brain very, very active with things. And, it, and they call it the executive functions of the brain they feel are very important. The data will come later, but they talk about the only data in terms of mental exercise that are good for the brain are more complicated than playing Sudoku or a, or a kind of a linear thing to do. Now, Daniel Amen, in his book, goes into a lot more detail, but it's essentially the same thing. He calls it bright minds. You know, good blood flow to the brain, never retire uh, from life, uh, you know, avoid inflammation, reduce inflammation, genetics. Uh, head trauma, of course, plays a role here, and if you've got that, that's a factor that you want to deal with. Toxins such as mercury, uh, good mental health, immunity and infections neurohormone deficiencies, the diabetes and the blood sugar, and uh, really good sleep. So uh, when he does the evaluation, he reviews these things, but pretty much I think you can see uh, the overlap of what this lifestyle does. It's fascinating that the, the neuro, the, you know, we were all taught that the central nervous system doesn't regenerate. But the peripheral nervous system sort of does at about a millimeter a month or something. I mean, that's our classic training. The central nervous system does regenerate. We have stem cells in our central nervous system. The body wants to heal. And as long as you stop the offender and, and basically adopt optimal health, regeneration does happen in the brain. Now, it's not going to happen necessarily at the very end stage of an Alzheimer's patient who doesn't recognize anything or anybody and is 90 years old or whatever. But in earlier, and maybe, and he shows even moderate cognitive decline, there's actually healing of the brain that happens. There's neurogenesis. Now, the data, you know, this is all, this is why I kind of talked on the EBM stuff. Everything I'm talking about is empiric. All the data is empiric, and it's, ba it's, in, it's not just empiric data on experience, but it's based on deeper understandings of pathophysiology. And I would argue that that's how much discovery happens in medicine uh, that turns out to be good. Uh, it's not always good, uh, but, it, but we have discovery in medicine, and this is a pretty exciting area of discovery in medicine uh, that's going on. But the evidence suggests that you need to have a total cholesterol over 125 and maybe as high as 150. Bredesen is recommending that your total cholesterol at least be 150. And when you go on the diet and you do the fasting and you, you lose your body fat, your HDL goes up and your LDL goes down and your LDL particles become less inflammatory. I mean, that's now very clear on the benefits of a low-carb diet with healthy fats compared to a low-fat diet with, with more <laughs> grains and carbs. Um, you know, that data has been clearly shown even in randomized controlled trials. That's why I go nuts when I see the recent article in JAMA saying that there was no difference between a low-carb diet and a low-fat diet. I mean, you, you don't have to drill very far to realize why that study uh, is weak and misses the point. But clearly, uh, uh, you know, that's critical. And so the neurologists, both Scherzeis and Bredesen, are very critical of the use of statins. As a matter of fact, drugs to get off of, statins are high on the list. And if you apply their lifestyle, virtually nobody needs a statin. Uh, why would statins not be good for the brain? They're anti-inflammatory. They have that added benefit, maybe improvement. But, but the problem with statins 
is that they drive the cholesterol too low. And, uh, and so the cardiologists who are obsessed with their LDL 70 or lower and there is no low point is the narrow vision of the cardiologist where the emerging neurology data says that's not good for you. And uh, I think the evidence is clear that it isn't. So I have a tug of war with my, uh, my cardiologists on statin doses and I've lessened people's statin doses as part of this work. This is where the family doc kind of gets in the middle of all this, and it gets kind of interesting in a multi-specialty group. But I do a lot of education and a lot of discussing. Um, even our neurologists haven't read Bredesen yet. That's the other kind of problem. Uh, you know, get your neurologist to read Bredesen. I mean, he's a, you know, he's an academic neurologist. So are the Schur's eyes. So there's still some education to take place. David Perlmutter is a neurologist who wrote Grain Brain, uh, documenting the evidence between sugar and the brain problems very clearly. He wrote Brain Maker, How to Have a Healthy Gut Microbiome, which is vital to your mood and the health of your brain. Uh, is now a huge cheerleader for Bredesen. Um, you know, Bredesen doesn't discriminate supplements very well. It leaves you with a lot of confusion. Pearl Mutter boils them down to what he think are seven important chemicals that you can get either from your diet or from supplements. DHA is the fish oil uh, for the brain, and uh, you may take that as a, as a supplement uh, or get it through, through healthy fish. By the way, Bredesen reinforces low toxicity fish and has now become the mantra is people should only eat the smash fish. S-M-A-S-H. It's easy to remember. Wild-caught salmon, <coughs> mackerel and fish in the mackerel family, anchovies, sardines, and herring. The smaller the fish, the better. The least toxicity. The larger the fish in the food chain out there, the more toxicity you're going to find. So eat the smash and recommend the smash fish. Uh, resveratrol, the people at Berkeley are, have that as a, you know, a healthy thing for the brain. It's a little bit of red wine. Bredesen does talk about it's okay to have a couple glasses of wine a week. Most of my patients aren't happy with that answer. I'm trying to get them down to one glass of wine a day because alcohol is toxic to the brain. Turmeric is interesting. It's the spice of curry. Uh, curcumin seems to be the active compound. I now put curry powder either on my eggs or in my bowl of nuts and flaxseed. Uh, it only takes a quarter teaspoon, apparently. Uh, this is all work in progress, but turmeric, uh, you can just buy it at the spice counter, and it's uh, great stuff. He likes probiotics. I prefer prebiotics. Prebiotics are the fiber of vegetables and fruit, and they basically fertilize your microbiome. Uh, you have a hundred trillion there, you might as well just feed them good food rather than throw an extra 20 billion organisms at them, which is, which is less than 1% of their population. So uh, I, talk, I consider probiotics, you know, like going and dumping some pails of fresh water into a contaminated sea and think that you're going to make it better. Uh, but coconut oil or olive oil very helpful to the brain. Alpha lipoic acid is one of the essential fatty acids that we actually convert into DHA. So it can be taken and then of course the vitamin D and getting your vitamin D level. Vitamin D is like a hormone that affects and, and the aging people, lifestyle medicine people think that one of the reasons we get old and die is like we do is that we get very low vitamin D levels as a senior because you know, evolution did not care how long we lived. It only wanted us to reproduce. And evolution gave us a mechanism of actually converting vitamin D from cholesterol. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, so you actually need cholesterol to have vitamin D, but the sun in the skin will convert vitamin D uh, from cholesterol. It doesn't come in natural foods of nature in any significant amount, but it's a vital vitamin. But our ability to convert vitamin D in our skin begins to decline around age 50. And it's essentially 
almost gone by the time we're a senior. Um, it just boggles my mind. We know that science is there. But the vitamin D people aren't talking about seniors as special group or whatever. I mean, it's just crazy the disconnect that we've got in, um, in, in kind of our mainstream thinking. But these are, the, these are the supplements that I talk about with patients. What to avoid is more important than anything, because what we do to give ourselves Alzheimer's, sugar and other high glycemic carbs, grains other than carbs, that, uh, other grains causing inflammation. So, I guess it's a typo, I'll have to fix that one. But anyway, the, the sugar and grains, cow's milk is an inflammatory food. Um, you know, we'd be better off with sheep or goat milk because it doesn't have the inflammatory KC that happens to be in cow's milk. Now remember the evolutionary biologists consider when we became farmers the biggest mistake we ever made was to cultivate the seeds of grasses and create wheat which we're not supposed to eat and then the second big mistake 8,000 years ago was to decide to make the milk of cows uh, part of our core diet and uh, and I, use, I drink unsweetened coconut milk. Um, the only part of cow's milk that's good is the fat. Uh, and so it, that's why actually butter, you know, in the, the new book by Mark Hyman actually quotes the data that butter reduces heart disease. A little bit of a paradigm shift for it, but, um, but butter, because it's only the fat from cow's milk is actually beneficial. It's probably beneficial to the brain. Avoid the processed vegetable oils. Again, it's another, you know, American food industry thing. I mean, American food industry has not always been our friend. It's about profit. I mean, first they take the sucrose away because we don't make sucrose in America anymore. Sugar's bad enough. But worse is high fructose corn syrup, which we metabolize in a way in the liver that causes inflammation. And uh, the other thing we do is the You'll see literature maybe bad mouthing coconut oil or you know coconut oil, olive oil pretty much come outside the United States and more expensive, and uh, and so we've created all these vegetable oils that are actually quite inflammatory to the body. So canola oil, a lot of the stuff that we've sort of been brainwashed is healthy, polyunsaturated oils. A lot of polyunsaturated oils are quite inflammatory to us, and um, and then the toxins that are in the food in the body. You know, what are your glyphosate levels? You know, pretty much all of us have glyphosate in our system. Now what's glyphosate? You know what glyphosate is? Roundup. You know, Roundup Ready Seeds. You know, <clears throat> delivered our friend from Monsanto that not only makes Roundup, they develop the Roundup Ready Seeds. So the farmers can you know, avoid weeds and have a food that we can eat, uh, but it's all got glyphosate in it. And so when you, when you go into detail of the various pesticides and toxins that are in food, it pretty much moves you to eating organic pretty quickly. Uh, and organic is more important than others, but it's important for avoiding things. So this is this area. Now, you know, the functional medicine I think has a lot of problems, and the Academy of Family Physicians have been kind of on guard with it. But what it really is, is about lifestyle medicine. Uh, the lifestyle is, is really the critically important thing here. And living a very healthy lifestyle, which I think you can do without falling victim to excessive testing, and certainly uh, not falling victim to a, uh, excessive supplements. Um, this is pretty exciting stuff. You know, I think that actually documented hard science that you can reverse cognitive decline has sort of taken something that is kind of fuzzy and nice and we all sort of nod with and uh, taking it to a whole more serious level. So I'll stop there. Um, you can send people to lunch or we can actually 12.15, I got 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Let's, let's take a few comments and then we can come back and continue the dialogue. A question about the grains. So, you know, I understand processed grains. I, you know, I've read the, the wheat belly and wheat grain and all that, and you know, I, and I get that. But what about the, the ancient grains? I mean, didn't human beings 
evolve eating amaranth and sorghum and teff and you know some of the, and quinoa, which is like all over the place now. Yeah, yeah the ancient grains go back 10,000 years, which is only like 2% of the time on Earth of our evolutionary biology as a species. Um, even ancient grains contain the gluten complex, and gliadins are the inflammatory protein within the gluten complex, um, and other prolamin proteins. So they do, they are basically grasses, and uh, while cows and other grazing animals have the stomach and the whole digestive system to do well on grasses, even the ancient grains are not considered a healthy food of nature. So less bad doesn't mean good. You know, our new modern dwarf wheat, the 42 chromosome dwarf wheat, is way more inflammatory than the 14 chromosome original einkorn wheat. And there's some interesting history, William Davis goes through it in detail, of what happened you know, between einkorn wheat with 14 chromosomes by the time of, of the Bible, and the, the, the wheat in the Bible was up to about 24 chromosomes uh, till finally Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution got it with this super-packed energy dwarf wheat. But they're all, they're all problematic, none of them are recommended. It's, you know, the, with a lot of nutrition, it, the, the poison is in the amount. Mm -hmm. And these were never big things to eat. Go ahead. I have two questions. The first, forgive me if this is obvious. It, of the point of care, of the point of care point, what is the difference and the similarity or disparity between insulin testing and having a glucose above 90? Like, it, would it be so high value to have both if I could just moderate that with the glucose? The glucose is a snapshot. It gives you at that point in time, that morning, what your fasting sugar was. But it doesn't give you a broader look. Now, the hemoglobin A1c, as we well know, gives you 12 weeks. Uh, but given the way it's measured out, it's not clear what's the healthy. Should it be 5.1, 5.4? Obviously, it should be below 5.5. But it doesn't give you as healthy a marker. The insulin spreads out the glucose stress. So, you know, it, it, it'll not only tell you what the, it corresponds with your fasting glucose, but if you had higher glucose during the day, you'll have higher fasting insulin levels. So it gives you a marker of what your glucose has been doing, even uh, other than fasting. So it gives you a broader look at sugar. And so anybody with, you know, we know you can't lose weight. You're not going to burn fat and, until your insulin goes below 10. Mm -hmm. Jason Fung and his obesity code and that group, you know, insulin is a, you know, insulin's a fat storage hormone. And the only time you can unlock the vault and start burning fat is if you get your insulin below 10. And he's the guru of intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. uh, but this takes it even down to another level. So the insulin level is important to, know whether you're going to be able to burn fat and, and, your, and the stress of your body of glucose. Okay, and then just very briefly, about statins. Now, is it something where one should think that the statins aren't necessarily helpful for everyone, but for like um, familial hyper, hyper lipidemia, and so that they would still benefit from statins? That, I hope that's not like a... No, it's not. You know, all these questions are really good, and I don't think we know all the answers. We really don't know the final answers about statin and cognitive decline over time. But obviously, I, get, I prescribe statins, but only for people who really need it. Now, obviously, a familiar a hyperlipidemic patient at very high risk of, of heart disease and stroke, uh, you may need to resort to a statin. Um, However, I find that if I get people's body fat to an optimal level and I get them on a good, very low carbohydrate diet, a foods of nature low carbohydrate diet, their risk pretty much disappears, even with a familial uh, hyperlipidemia, although I'm sure there are exceptions and there are people who need the statins, but they're not very common. You know, the familial thing is, again, a genetic, and we now know it's all epigenetic. It's the, you know, it load, you know the genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the triggers. And, uh, and so that's what you can deal with. And, you, and as Mamadi said, any disease that can be treated with diet should never be treated any other way.
Joe, I've been a student of yours for, I think, probably 40 years, and I've been listening to your presentations, um, and every time I hear one, I go home uh, and talk to my wife, and with great excitement tell her that I've just heard the new greatest information that I've heard in a long time. So and I, every time I do that, she said, wait a minute, last time you said this is the newest, greatest information. <coughs> this information is pretty darn interesting. Um, I'm interested in your, you said to me this morning that this is the most significant of all of the things I've heard you talk about over the years, all of which have been very interesting, very important, and new knowledge. Why is this one rank? Why, why do you rank this above the others? I'm very curious. Well, it reinforces, it reinforces the others, but it's something that is really, really serious and really hard. I mean, we've all known about risk factors for heart disease and stroke, and you know, we all known about that and lower your risk factors and all that's been good. And I'm not saying that stuff's not important, but this is a big deal, and uh, and we've got, I mean, among seniors, the developing cognitive decline is happening before our eyes, and to know that we one what's causing it and that it's actually reversible, you know, should change really all of our, all of our practice uh, behavior. And so it's just, it's, it's like, you know, but, you know, I'm the kind of guy, though, that every time I read a good book, my life has been changed, and, and uh, who knows, and I am sort of living in the present and looking at the future, so maybe my enthusiasm, but this is, you know, this feels like even bigger than, you know, my diet change I made five years ago. So I'm safe telling my wife. <laughs> Please do. This is this is this is really cool. Yeah. All three of you lists mentioned an hour of exercise. Did they, um, when counseling our elderly patients, did they specify what type of exercise or just any? No. All all exercise works. It should be movement. It should be movement and strength training. I mean that's. I mean this is a fuzzy science for sure. We just know it's good for you. You know people who do exercise show better cognitive function than people who don't, but it, it can be anything. You know, there is a, there, there was an interesting study that's now been replicated because uh, multiple choice quiz. What's the best running? What's the best exercise? Running, walking, dancing, weight training, whatever. And it turned out far and away dancing was the best exercise that people can do. Uh, it's like a perfect exercise. It requires cognitive function. You've got to listen to the music. You've got to get into the beat. Uh, you, you know, you've got to use your coordination, and it's good exercise. So right now, dancing is the, is the uh, darling uh, exercise. And, and there have been, been actually been examples of people with cognitive decline that if you play the music they loved and they used to dance, that they like light up and come alive before your eyes. But, you know, that's using those long-term memories. But dancing is a good one. So Thanks I, a lot, Joe. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, we can discuss some more when we come back.